the United States was very concerned about Salvador Allende, who got elected president of Chile in 1970. Allende had run earlier in 1964 against Eduardo Frey. And in that election, the, U the CIA was heavily involved in supporting Frey. When Allende ran again in 1970, the CIA pulled out all the stops. They did everything they could to prevent Allende from winning the election in 1970, but they failed. They had a two track, track one and track two strategy. Track one was to use whatever propaganda they could to prevent Allende from winning the election and then prevent him from being seated. So they used their foreign agents in the press. They had many people in the press. They used their disinformation campaign in order to try to block Allende. After Allende won the election anyway, despite the CIA efforts, then the U.S. really went to work. Allende was inaugurated, uh, took office November 3rd, 1970. Two days later, Nixon began, President Richard Nixon began his campaign against Allende. Uh, he basically had Richard Helms, the director of the CIA, run the operation. Helms ran it through uh, Atlee Phillips, who was the station chief for the CIA in Brazil. Uh, he worked with the station chief in Chile. Uh, first, they ran a an economic campaign to destroy the Chilean economy. Chile, uh, the economy was dominated by the copper interests, especially Anaconda copper and Kennecott copper. But another major player was IT&T. So working with them, they made every effort they could to destabilize the Chilean economy, much like they do now with Iran, much like they do with Russia uh, they, they, or North Korea. They pull out all the stops when it comes to the economy, thinking that that's going to create pressure inside the country for forces to rise up to overthrow the elected governments in those countries or not all those countries have elected governments by our standards, but they certainly, Chile did in 1970. But Allende was a socialist. They considered him a Marxist. He was an ally of Fidel Castro. He talked about nationalizing IT&T and the copper industry in Chile. And so the US with its Chilean allies and its assets decided to overthrow Allende. Uh, they destabilized the economy. When that didn't work, they decided they would have to go to track two and assassinate him. Uh, but Allende fought back. And in late 1972, he made a very impassioned speech to the United Nations. And the place was, it was an uproar, it was an amazing speech. People were on their feet yelling, Viva Allende, Viva Allende. He got a standing ovation. The U.S. ambassador at that moment was George H.W. Bush. George H.W. Bush was so taken with the moment that he also joined the standing ovation. And he later said, oh, the United States is not imperialist. I disagree with what he's saying. Uh, but Allende made the scathing indictment of the U.S. and the U.S. effort to overthrow him. That might have been the end for uh, Allende. Nixon and Kissinger, and Kissinger was really the mastermind who ran this, from the White House. Kissinger, who won the Nobel Peace Prize. Kissinger should be in the dock in The Hague, not getting the Nobel Peace Prize, um, ran this operation with Helms and Nixon. They bypassed the usual channels in the State Department and others who they knew would be opposed to this. In fact, the US ambassador uh, in Chile was opposed to this operation. It was so heavy handed, so ham fisted, uh, that some of the CIA personnel were opposed to this operation, but that didn't stop Nixon and it didn't stop Kissinger. And when Helms people were not going along with that, first Helms went along with Nixon's demand and he fired four of his six deputies, but that wasn't enough for Nixon. And Nixon went ahead and fired Helms and he blamed them for allowing Allende to win the election in the first place. And so it went 1972 and 1973 working with David Atlee Phillips, 
uh, they ran this operation. First, they assassinated General Rene Schneider, who was uh, the, the head of the Chilean military, who was a constitutionalist and cannot be bribed, but they had a lot of, lot of other military assets. In fact, the U.S. had trained more than 4,000 Chilean officers in the School of the Americas and in the United States. So the U.S. had created this network in Chile already that they were able to call upon in 73 and exploit. And the operation was run by General Augusto Pinochet. He and his bloodthirsty henchmen killed thousands of people. Uh, they incarcerated, tortured 100,000 more. Uh, and and S September 11th, 1973, the United States began the coup attempt uh, against Allende. Allende took to the national radio. He exposed what was happening. He said that uh, his, his own death uh, would not be in vain. He killed himself as the troops were approaching. He killed himself with a rifle that had been given him by his friend Fidel Castro. Uh, there is actually a plaque there uh, that, from Castro to his friend Allende uh, on the rifle that Allende used to uh, kill himself. So that that was the U.S. Uh, inspired coup overthrow of a democratically elected, incredibly popular uh, president, Salvador Allende in Chile. So that's so that's that's the 9-11 in Chile, which uh, what happened to the United States actually, uh, as terrible as it was, pales by comparison with what happened in Chile. The dem democracy in Chile went back to, I think it was 1932, but the democracy cannot outlast Nixinger, Nixon and Kissinger. And the exchanges, I mean, we have this, we have the transcripts of what they said to each other when they took credit for overthrowing Allende. And I could read some of it because it's really outrageous. But this, but so Kissinger's bloody fingers were all over this, along with Nixon's. And then, uh, then after that, they began or they supported Operation Condor, uh, which was run by the head of the Chilean intelligence with the other right wing governments uh, across Latin America. And uh, Operation Condor, uh, with the caravan of death, killed thousands and thousands and thousands of dissidents all over Latin America, tens of thousands outside of their own country and put scores of thousands in prison and who were tortured and abused, but more than 10,000 were killed in Project Condor that the, C that the US at least facilitated, uh, if not was directly implicated. And there was pressure on Kissinger to intervene to get these right-wing governments in Latin America to stop this assassination program across Latin America, and Kissinger refused to do so. He actually had an order out to these countries to stop this, and then he withdrew the order. So Kissinger is up to his eyeballs and blood uh, and, and murder and assassination. And the fact that this son of a bitch would get uh, the Nobel Peace Prize is an obscenity. And the Nobel Committee is never going to live that one down. Uh, the, year, the year before, after Sato, the uh, Japanese prime minister got it also, which was also an outrage. Uh, and then Obama getting it was another outrage. So, uh, but uh, Kissinger is a murderer. He cannot travel in much of the world because he knows he will get arrested and brought before the uh, International Tribunal, as should be the case. I, get, I mean, the context that I would provide for 9-11 is much more focused on the U.S. policy 
and U.S. response rather than uh, what happened <clears throat> with al-Qaeda and Afghanistan. Uh, from the U.S. perspective, it really begins with, I would say, 1992 and the U.S. drawing up the defense planning guidance. In 1990, uh, Charles Krauthammer, leading neocon strategist, write, uh, uh, writes a piece and gives a speech uh, for uh, gives a speech for the what was then the budding neocons of their day, the Scoop Jackson dinner from American Enterprise Institute, in which he says that now with the collapse of the Russia Soviet Union uh, and the falling of the Berlin Wall. The United States has and has become the world's unipolar force. He says this is the unipolar moment. He says it's likely to last 30 or 40 years before anybody can challenge the United States for global hegemony. The U.S. can dominate the world, call the shots, uh, really run rough shot over the rest of the planet. He says this could last for 30 or 40 years. Then they they actually put this out in writing in the defense planning guidance, which was overseen by Cheney, Wolfowitz, uh, Zalmay Khalilzad, who we see is in the press now, was instrumental in this, uh, Libby, Fife, I mean, the whole crew. Uh, and so they put forth this plan. They have to withdraw it. They have to deny it because when this start would leak to the press, people were horrified. But this was their strategy. In 1997, they organized an organization to actually carry this out. It's called the Project for a New American Century. It's actually going to be proposed and run by Robert Kagan and by um, William um, uh, Bill Crystal. Bill Crystal and Robert Kagan are the masterminds behind this, and it puts together a list of all the leading neocon thinkers. And, and uh, so their vision is for a, a, a new American century. The United States is going to dominate the 21st century the way the United States dominated the second half of the 20th century. That's their vision. That no force anywhere is going to be allowed to emerge, no nation or group of nations that can challenge US hegemony in any region of the world should be allowed to emerge. Uh, and nobody should be allowed to develop weapons of mass destruction that can challenge the United States. So this is in 1997. In 2000, they put forth a program for rebuilding America's defenses. And they call for a massive increase in American military spending. But they say that the United States is not gonna go along with this. They're gonna have to slow walk this massive rebuilding of America's defenses, uh, unless there's some catalyzing and catastrophic event like a new Pearl Harbor. That's the word they use. Uh, they say, unless we have a new Pearl Harbor. This is in 2000. The election in 2000, some of the neocons supported John McCain instead of George W. Bush. In fact, uh, you've got Kagan, uh, and some of the others supporting McCain. They said he's a real war hero and a real militarist, or a hawk who wants to fight everywhere. Others said, no, George W. Bush would be our man. He's more pliable. He'll go along and do what, anything we want. They ended up throwing their support behind Bush. But during the campaign, Bush disavowed the neocon agenda. He says, we're not in favor of nation building. We're not gonna go around the world doing these things. Uh, it's interesting. Because on 9-11, 2001, when the U.S. gets hit, Bush changes. Some of the neocons said Bush was fundamentally transformed by 9-11. And so by, by what happened then, Bush now says we have to run a global campaign, a crusade, he calls it. And he draws back that language because the crusade has such a meaning in the rest of the world. So when he says a crusade, against evil. We're going to wipe out evil around the planet. Others had a real sense of what they wanted to do. It's amazing that on 9-11, 
when Bush was off flying around somewhere or reading this children's book in Florida to this class of second graders, uh, Cheney and Wolfowitz and, and Pearl and Libby and Rumsfeld immediately knew what they wanted to do. On 9-11, and then again on 9-12, when Bush is back in the Oval Office, uh, they're saying to Richard Clark, who was in charge of America's counterintelligence at the time, they're saying, see what Saddam Hussein's role was in this. And Richard Clark says, what are you talking about? This was Al-Qaeda. This was not Saddam Hussein. He says, in fact, Saddam Hussein hates Al-Qaeda. Saddam Hussein is opposed to these things. Uh, and they say, well, find out what he did. Rumsfeld says, oh, but there's no good targets in Afghanistan. Iraq has all the good targets. Uh, and they, they're saying to Tenet and to the CIA and to Richard Clark, find out uh, what, what uh, Iraq's role was in all this. Clark couldn't believe what he was hearing and nor could his deputies. And they said that, you know, they couldn't believe that, that they were gonna use this. He said they wanted to use this as an excuse for invading Iraq, for overthrowing Saddam Hussein. And that's what the Project for a New American Century had been saying from the very beginning. The Project for a New American Century had been targeting Iraq. Afghanistan was not of real importance to these people. It was a minor player. But Iraq had defied the United States in the first Gulf War. And now we're saying we have our chance to get rid of Saddam Hussein. But that was not all. So on September 20th, the Project for a New American Century puts out another paper signed by all these leading neocons, many of whom were already in the Bush administration. 11 leading members of the Project for a New American Century had top positions within the Bush administration and other neocons were in there as well. Cheney was in there as vice president. Rumsfeld was in there as secretary of defense, but they were in there across the board. Pearl and, and Wolfowitz as deputy, deputy secretary of defense, they were all in there. Many of them were in there already. What they say in that 20, that September 20th uh, paper that they wrote and, and, and or letter they wrote to Bush was even if Iraq is not involved in 9-11, we've got to go after and overthrow the government of Iraq. But that was just the beginning. So, and then on, then the United States uh, in October, I think it was October 7th, I could get the exact date in October 2001, they decide to start Operation Enduring Freedom and the invasion of Afghanistan. Now, even the invasion of Afghanistan, okay, so Al-Qaeda did operate out of Afghanistan, we know that. The United States had met with Taliban leaders more than 20 times discussing turning over uh, Osama bin Laden to the United States. In fact, the Taliban was ready to turn over Osama bin Laden. They, they actually, the Taliban foreign minister proposed turning bin Laden over to the Iraq, I forget the name of the exact group. Um, what was it? Um, the, uh, the Islamic Conference, the Organization of the Islamic Conference. The Taliban foreign minister said that he would turn bin Laden over to the, this organization and put him on trial. The United States said, no, no, we want you to turn him over to the United States directly. Milton Bearden was the former station chief. He had run the operation in Afghanistan against the Soviet Union out from Pakistan in the 1980s. Milton Bearden said that the the Taliban was begging the United States to give them an excuse, a, a face-saving measure to turn bin Laden over to the United States for trial, like the United States was demanding. But the United States, he says, blew it and did not give them that. And so they couldn't turn bin Laden over, uh, which is what they actually wanted to do. So the United States begins the invasion of Afghanistan. It seemed exhilarating in the beginning, even though they did not have, Rumsfeld did not want boots on the ground because he did not want American casualties. So we did this bombing campaign. We had the uh, Al-Qaeda leaders trapped in Tora Bora 
but we allowed them to escape. So even that was inept. But according to Krauthammer, this was exhilarating. He said, we have proven how powerful the United States is. Nothing like this has ever existed before in the history of mankind. And so in 2002, uh, Krauthammer says, I was wrong in 1990 when I said this was the, uh, the, op this was the um, unilateral moment. He said, this is actually the unilateral era. He said, I, when I said 30 or 40 years, I underestimated how powerful the United States really was. He said, this could last indefinitely that the U.S. will control the world. And this was the, and this was the vision that these clowns had. Well, then things didn't go so well, really, in Afghanistan or in Iraq. And by 2000, as soon thereafter, as uh, the head of the Arab League says, the gates of hell are open in Iraq now. And the jihadis from all over the world saw that as their opportunity. And they flooded into Iraq. And they flooded into Afghanistan. Uh, and then the, by 2006, even a crowd hammer finally got it. And he said, well, I exaggerated. I overestimated our strength. And he said, the, in the uh, unilateral era is over. Even the unilateral moment is now threatened. And what we see, the United States has been in Afghanistan for 18 years now. The United States, and wh who won in Iraq? Not the United States. You've got a government in Iraq that's beholden to Iran. The Iranians were the big winner from these geniuses, these idiots who went in there and thought the United States could impose its will through the barrel of a gun. And it didn't happen. And it hasn't happened overall. But what they did have was this fantasy. You know, their wet dream was this American empire. And so you have the neocons. First you have, uh, then you've got, uh, all of them coming out, Crystal in his in publication talks about American empire, Max Boot. You want to see Max Boot? You turn on CNN now in the United States and you see this idiot. You know, now he's a big wise man. Here he's talking about, oh, we need to have an American empire. The New York Times fell for this, not surprisingly. And on January 5th, 2003, the New York Times headlined the Sunday magazine section cover story, American Empire, get used to it. And so they started to talk about the United States taking over various parts of the world. So you've got John Bolton and Bolton says, well, we've got to overthrow the government in Syria. We've got to overthrow the government in North Korea. We've got to overthrow the government in Iran. Uh, General Wesley Clark, former head of NATO military mission, Clark goes to the Pentagon and talks to some, some commanding officers there. And they tell him, we've got a five-year plan to overthrow seven governments. And so we, we're talking about remaking the map of the world, uh, these neocon strategists. This was their fantasy. We're going to remake the map of the world. And so we're going to begin with Afghanistan. Then we're going to go into uh, Iraq. And then we're going to do Syria. And then we're going to do uh, Iran. And, and they've got this list of all these countries. Libya was, was high on everybody's list also. And this was the fantasy. And, but the fantasy becomes a, not a reality in terms of its results, but it becomes a reality in terms of what they, what they actually try to do. And what has this done? The United States has spent trillions and trillions of dollars. We've killed more than a million people probably, we don't know exact numbers, we don't keep track of the numbers of Arabs who and Middle Easterners who we kill, Muslims, you know, Muslims life are cheap in the United States. Uh, and, and, but we also changed the United States. And so in addition to these forever wars that we embark on, we tear up the US Constitution, we, we pass the Patriot Act, in fact, the only one who <clears throat> voted against the Patriot Act in the Senate was Russ Feingold, to his everlasting glory. He voted against it. They rushed it through in the House. They rushed it through even faster in the Senate. The senators didn't even have time to read it. 
and the patriotic fools they call they thought of themselves as patriots the opposite of real patriots they blindly went along with this and basically shredded the u.s constitution and so then we have this massive surveillance program uh, this massive militarization of the united states this intelligence operation and then we have this five color intelligence scheme this warning to drive americans make americans paranoid play on american fear and and and, and then you got the chicken hawks taking over the george w bushes the cheney what how many deferments did cheney have five and but but and then they then they've got to uh, start this massive campaign of lies we know what a liar trump is but the bush administration was only a few steps behind them and and then they when they did this the american public was not supporting the war in an invasion of iraq only a third of the american people were supporting the invasion of iraq so what does bush do his brilliant move is to pick colin powell colin powell was the only one in that administration who had real credibility so bush says you go before the United Nations, maybe they'll believe you because they certainly didn't believe him and they didn't believe Cheney and they didn't believe Rumsfeld and they didn't believe Wolfowitz. The New York Times called these plotters the Wolfowitz cabal. But so they pick Colin Powell and Colin Powell is February 2003, I think it was February 5th, 2003, goes before the United Nations and, he's, and he shows this vial of white powder and he says, this little bit of anthrax can kill thousands of people. And he says, we've got the best intelligence. We're not guessing at this. This is not speculation. This is cold, hard facts. And Powell did have credibility, sadly. And he talked about these mobile biolog biological laboratories that, that, we, that there are in, in Iraq. Uh, and it was all nonsense and lies. And Powell later admitted that this was a low point in his career. He had some other low points that he didn't admit to that we could talk about. But so, but what happens, it didn't work globally. Around the world, people knew that this was a pack of lies that was spread by the United States and his lapdog, Tony Blair, in Britain and the stuff that he fed. So, you know, Bush gives his State of the Union address in 2003, and he talks about the, uh, the British intelligence about this uranium that was being uh, set, sent over to Iraq from Africa. Again, lies, 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 which Joe Wilson uh, exposed very clearly. Uh, so people knew it was lies, but, but, uh, but approval for the US invasion of Iraq jumped from a third to 50% after Powell's address. But it, it, around Europe and other parts of the world, uh, in, in Europe, 84% of people who were polled said that the United States was the main threat to world peace. I think what 7% or 9% said Iraq was the main threat to world peace. Around the planet, people knew this. And so the United States st st uh, calls for inspections of Iraq to find the weapons of mass destruction. And we can't find it anywhere. Hans Blix the chief UN weapons inspector says, how can you be 100% sure of where the that Iraq has weapons of mass destruction and have a 0% accuracy in telling us where they are? The UN weapons inspectors had access all over Iraq and they couldn't find anything. In fact, Iraq released a dossier 11,800 pages long detailing their destruction of weapons of mass destruction after the uh, first Gulf War. What a main defector to the United States was Saddam Hussein's son-in-law, who had overseen Iraq's weapons of mass destruction program. And he gave such detailed evidence to the United States about the destruction that uh, Ralph Eckes said that it was embarrassing the detail he gave us. And then we knew that, that according to Scott Ritter, a UN weapons inspector, who said that there was no weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, Scott Ritter said that biological weapons have a shelf life of three years and that chemical weapons have a shelf life of five years, and we, but they were all destroyed 
and they didn't have time to rebuild this. So we knew that there were no weapons of mass destruction, but it was lies. The same lies you see coming out of Donald Trump's mouth every single day were coming out of George Bush's mouth every single day, and not just Bush. It was also Cheney. It was also Condoleezza Rice. And what was their scare tactic? Tactic. We don't want to see the smoking gun be a mushroom cloud. That 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 Iraq was developing uh, nuclear weapons. Also, nonsense. And the same kind of lies that we see about Iran. You know, the weapons of mass destruction. We have to overthrow the government in Iran. We've seen this game plan before. We've seen the playbook. As Larry Wilkerson said very clearly, we saw this. Wilkerson was Colin Powell's chief of staff. Larry's a friend of mine. He was a colonel. He was a chief of staff. And he's warned that the same game plan they used in Iraq, they're using now in Iran. Exact same thing. But people have such a short memory. Uh, so and so this is what and then that and then they go ahead and they invade Iraq. And it turns out to be an absolute effing disaster uh, for the Iraqis, for the Americans, for U.S. foreign policy, for the world. Millions of people were out in the street protesting that three million people showed up in Rome, three billion people. You know, around all of the world, ten, some of the estimates are as high as 20 million people protested U.S. invasion of Iraq. That figure is probably exaggerated. But this is what this is what the, the aftermath of 9-11 was in the United States. And the United States begins this program around the world, extraordinary rendition. You know, we started kidnapping people around the world. We put them into black sites. One of the countries that took these people who the United States rounded up was Bashar al-Assad's Syria. Hosni Mubarak's Egypt took them, but Syria took them. That's where we were sending these people. We sent more than 700, almost 800 to Guantanamo, where they were tortured. We sent them to Abu Ghraib, where they were raped. You know, the expose there. This was so embarrassing. The United States had always prided itself on its treatment of prisoners. What were we doing now? We were torturing them. We were raping them. We were waterboarding them. We, we were uh, elect putting electrodes on their genitals. We were st stripping them naked and making them stay like that for days, weeks at a time. I mean, we know the, the horrible things the United States was doing under this torture program. Uh, and, and, we were, and most of them were innocent. Most of the people they sent to Guantanamo were released because there was there's no evidence. We were giving rewards to people who capture people on the battlefields. And so people would go around and capture people, innocents, turn them into the United States for the reward money. And this is what the United, the United States became a lawless country on a global scale. And so this was the American reputation, if it had ever existed in a positive way, uh, was totally torn to shreds by the Bush administration. And many of those policies were continued by Obama, and then they were continued by Trump. You know, so it, the United States was a very imperfect democracy to begin with, but a lot of what existed, what was positive, was ruined uh, after 9/11. And the surveillance on a massive scale now as still continues.